Je suis Marie-Monique Steckel and today we launch our first iconic luncheon with Jacques Attali, organized, thought through, curated by Olivier Barrault, who, as you all know, is my favorite star of the French cinema. And he, he at 6.45, will present Ascenseur pour l'échafaud. And if you have not seen Ascenseur pour l'échafaud, you should dash to see it tonight. At 6.45, he will give a talk. And at 7.30, we have the movie. But today, and right now, you're here for Jacques Attali. Now, Jacques Attali is a wizard. He has done so many things that Olivier will explain to you that you will go home thinking, how can such a man have done all of that? Now, Jean Caroubi and Jacques were good friends when they were very young, and Jean has said that at the time, everybody knew that Jacques Attali, already very young, knew that he was going to be an extraordinary human being. So we're really, truly very, very lucky to have Jacques Attali with us today. And his influence has crossed the Atlantic. He has many friends in New York and all over the world. Now, we are delighted to work, to have worked on this luncheon with the Foreign Policy Association. And you all know that Noel Latif is one of the leader of the Foreign Policy Association. And he also gives his association a wonderful leadership. And of course, he said yes to us. So he's wonderful. We know. We know that. So je, je voudrais aussi remercier Air France. Uh, Air France is a partner of FIAF and Delta as well, but Air France and Stéphane Normand is a special friend of ours, and we're delighted that he has a table today with some of his wonderful friends here. You all have the program, so I won't get into the next two luncheons, but Olivier might say a word about it, and enjoy, and have a wonderful time. Merci beaucoup. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure, Jacques Attali and mine, to be here with you. Uh, you have so, so many, and it's quite impressive. But we'll try and adapt ourselves to that and uh, try and let Jacques explain a few of his uh, beliefs, activities, and his past, as well as its present activities that are so numerous. Um, you know that Jacques Attali uh, graduated from what we have, our institute, most prestigious institution in France, and he's been uh, active in so many fields. He's been a politician, he's been a banker, he's been a teacher, he still is, in a way. He's an investor, he's an inventor. Above all, I guess he's a writer, He's also a conductor. He knows a little more than we do about music, as far as I'm concerned, at least. And uh, if we had to uh, sum up his career and life, it would take far more than uh, the time we still have to, to spend together. So I will ask him a few questions about uh, his beliefs. And whereas he just told me no personal questions, which is too bad because my intention was precisely to emphasize this aspect of his personality. Uh, we'll get back to some of them at, anyway. Uh, first of all, Jacques, please let us know about this extraordinary story of yours, history of your family. Jacques Attali was born in Algeria, which at this time was French. He's got a twin brother who's been in charge of Air France at a time, Stéphane. You know that better than we do. And uh, you had uh, a father and a mother that were so... Okay. Um, I think you have to draw a, a portrait of those two people. And um, I would like you to insist on those particular choices that were made by your own father at a time when Algeria was going to get into uh, some sort of a civil war 
which obliged the family to move over the Mediterranean to uh, continental France, and which has been the actual start of your extraordinary career and achievements. Would you mind letting us, letting us know about this family of yours, uh, those well, uh, people? Well, uh, thank you very much, but I ask you not to raise any personal questions. <laughs> you know, I'm obeying you. <laughs> uh, I will answer to this one, because it's a... It's a it's a tribute to my father and my mother, but that would be the only one. Actually, I'm embarrassed about it because I'm not narcissist. I never wrote about myself. I hide myself be behind my work, uh, my work on different fields, uh, charity, uh, writing, teaching, etc. And uh, I'm not narcissist. Uh, I hate uh, the kind of French writers who wrote about themselves and consider that they are the center of the world. I'm not. Uh, I think what is important is what we do what we give, what we transmit, and not what we are. But this may be uh, interesting for all of you mm. to know, and uh, I have a close friend who was a witness of that, which is here today. Uh, I was born in a Jewish family in Algeria. My family was there, I suppose, more than f five centuries. The first language of my mother and my father was Arabic. Actually, we speak Arabic between them. And unfortunately, they did their best that we don't speak Arabic. My brother, my sister, and myself, because we consider that the language of the future was French, and then they forbid us to speak Arabic. Uh, what is important, one of the reasons, I suppose, why I'm so interested in trying to understand the future, and that I spent so many of my books about uh, understanding the future, is certainly linked to uh, my father. Because, uh, as you said, I was born uh, uh, November 1st, uh, in, and November 1st was the beginning of the Algerian Revolution. And I remember very well that the day of this revolution, the first start of the uh, Algerian Revolution, my father said to my mother and myself and my brother, my sister was too, too young, we quit. Which was an amazing decision at a moment where it was, they were there for more than five centuries. We have no relation at all with uh, Paris and all that. We have no knowledge. My father and my mother have never been to school, mm -hmm. except the beginning. They speak perfect French with no accent, neither Arabic nor Piennois what, whatsoever. But they were absolutely out of anything. They were very good in their business, but nothing to do with uh, scholarship or whatever. And that's it. He said that, and I didn't hear about it more for, for a year. And one day, it was in April uh, 56, he said, uh, tomorrow you say to the teachers that you quit. Uh, the day after tomorrow, you're in France forever. We will never come back. You will never come back. And you have to say to your friends that uh, it's just for holidays. It didn't, we, we left uh, um, confidentially because it would have been amazing and uh, impossible to understand, even for the family. Mm -hmm. that and we arrived in Paris. I discovered that my father has found a way to organize his own business in France. He has found a, a flat, an apartment. In a particular place in Paris. Just in front of what I, he has been told was the most, the best lycée in Paris. And it was a door in front. It made only one mistake because it was just in front of the entry for teachers and not the entry for the students. <laughs> uh, just 10 meters away. No, nothing more. And then uh, that was the beginning of, uh, of a new life with not, nothing around us except, uh, except uh, books. Because I remember very well that when we arrived, uh, my brother and myself, we had nothing to do. No, no friends, nothing, nothing. And a school. piano? A piano? Piano, yes. Piano. We had piano before. Um, and uh, I said to my father, we, we need, to, we need to, to have books. He said, yes, why not? Let's go to a bookshop. And we went down to a bookshop, and my father f found a, a bookseller, which was so good to sell him the entire collection of La Pléiade that day, <laughs> <laughs> which was not as large as it is today, but it was 200 books. And we came back with 200 books of La Pléiade when we were 13. And my brother and, my, and my brother and myself, we began to read uh, Racine, Molière, etc., etc., at, at 12, 12 years old. 
That's the only personal question I will answer. <laughs> Just a word about music, because it's a part of your education and your practice today. Did you actually start studying music at this time, piano playing, or was it a part of the uh, yeah, family I, education? Yeah. My father and my mother has nothing to do with music, nothing to do with scholars, scholars mm -hmm. studies, but they, they put us, my brother and myself and my sister, in front of the piano. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I was very, always very grateful that my, my mother insists that I stay on the piano even when I wanted to quit. Mm -hmm. And then I stayed on the piano. Okay. Uh, that's something that I think very important. When, when, when you try something, uh, there is a moment where uh, you think you, it's not for you, you have to quit. But if you stay and you continue, then you pass a kind of invisible wall and then you are in. And then it's a wonderful uh, new continent that is open. It was the same for me for mathematics. Mm -hmm. At the beginning I was not especially uh, good at mathematics. But I, I work hard, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I went through the wall. <laughs> yes. So uh, you'll be a student at Polytechnique, which is probably one of the most difficult uh, type of uh, exams you can go through in France. Then you graduated at École Nationale d'Administration, where you met quite a few people that were doomed or that were aimed at major political careers. My dear friend, you are stubborn and I am stubborn. <laughs> Let's move to more. Let's yes, move. We, we, yeah. we're moving to politics. Oh, and okay. and you've, been, you've been very active on, on that side, mm. and you still are in a way. Yes. You're not a politician, you're not being elected. You've been very active as a special advisor to President Mitterrand from 1973 to uh, 1991. I, I was his advisor in the opposition. I, oh. I, I decided. My, my model at that time was um, uh, a French uh, intellectual called uh, Raymond Aron, which was uh, an intellectual mm -hmm. a scholar uh, writing about politics and whispering to the politicians. And another model came later and, and became a very close friend of mine, which is Henry Kissinger, uh, which means I like to, to advise, to, but I want to be independent. I want to be independent because I always think that um, it's important to recognize that you may be wrong, and a politician never recognizes that he's wrong. He cannot. And I want to be in position to change my mind, and a politician cannot change his mind. I want to agree with my opponent, it's impossible for a politician. And then I want to keep uh, my freedom of thinking and my freedom of, of writing. And even when I advise for some he, he pushed me hard to become, to, to be candidate for elections or to be a, a leader, a member of a leadership of a party uh, or so on, I refused because I wanted to keep my independence. He was kind enough to accept that and then he asked me to be his main advisor at the, during his mandate. Well, you had something in common with Mitterrand that was, he was a man of books, just like you are. He was a reader and a writer. Yes. So, uh, so are you. Yes, we, we have that in common, uh, even, and he, he, was, he, had, he, had, he had an amazing culture, which was very different from mine. Um, he has a culture which is very, very French. Mm. He knew a little about American literature, but nothing else. And he, he, has an amazing, he had an amazing knowledge of a French mm. 19th and 20th century literature. He, 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 had a, he was hypermnesic, hypermnesic, therefore he has a, an amazing uh, knowledge and I, I learned a lot. Uh, oh, you have not read this book? Shame. And that was all the time. And even it, when we had a um, very important political session, I remember at the beginning of his mandate we had a s summit mm -hmm. in, uh, it was a, an equivalent of a G20 that didn't exist. And there was a moment which was very tough, very tough, it was a mess and everything. And. Uh, Where was that? Was it the Versailles it, summit? It, no, no, it was in Cancun. It was oh, in Cancun. Cancun. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw him he quit the room. We were only two of us, the president and, and myself in the room, 20 leaders. And he quit. And he said, I go to my room. I said, what do I do? Just wait. And then the mess was worse than everything and chaos in the discussion. And then I quit. I came back to his room to see him and he was reading uh, Les Mémoires d'Outre-Tombe de Chateaubriand. And he stayed there, he said, you should come, well, let's wait. And he stayed two hours reading Les Mémoires de Trotome, and he came down, and it was over. It was time to, it was ripe. 
ah. to propose a compromise. Mm -hmm. He had the idea of the momentum, yeah. the way to behave at a mm. certain period of time in such a summit. Um, but I guess this is big, basic for you, this experience. So close, you were the closest advisor to President Mitterrand at this time, and you, you attended and you organized so many world summits with... Uh, was his, I was uh, his number one at, at, uh, uh, assistant for uh, mm -hmm. 10 years in the position and 10 years in, uh, in the government, but he was kind enough to accept that I keep on teaching, yeah. I keep on writing, uh, and uh, I keep on being independent, mm -hmm. which was kind. <laughs> and in those times, that was uh, some 25 years ago, approximately, um, but did you, uh, uh, did you at this time start thinking about what would be your next commitment as far as what you're doing now with uh, the, the bank in banking and your influence on uh, global uh, Well, uh, it's difficult to say that, but uh, I had always in mind that I have books in mind, novels, yeah. essays that I want to write, and then mm -hmm. these books come one after the other. It's more than 75 now. I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that was in my mind. The other, it was very clear in my mind that I want to serve, to be useful, and then I created uh, different institutions. I create uh, something called Action Contre la Fin, mm -hmm. which, was, uh, which is still today one of the most important NGO in the world. I create a very important European institution called Eureka, which is a yeah. fundamental institution in Europe to develop the uh, uh, technology. I create uh, EBRD, the European Bank for hooking Eastern Europe to the rest of, uh, of the continent. And now I've created later on uh, the foundation I chair today, which is Positive Planet, which exists for more than 20 years now, which support uh, the very poor people uh, around the world, uh, pro providing training and microfinance in more than 40 countries around the world. Mm -hmm. We have an office in New York, by the way. Yeah. And uh, what are the, the future challenges you are going to face? Do you know already what you'll be working well, on in, <laughs> those, in the coming years? I have many, many, uh, many things I've not tried, but I'm trying. First thing I wanted to try, first I'm not sure, as all of us, I'm not sure to be reincarnated. We are not sure. <laughs> Therefore, I prefer to live seven lives simultaneously, that one yeah. after the other. <laughs> then uh, I decided to try many things. One was, uh, as you said, conducting. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very hard to try because uh, I, I'm not, I'm not the slightest uh, gift for that. Uh, I'm, I'm very clumsy, very clumsy. Then I took uh, lessons for five years, three and, and two, by a young professor, which happened to be, and now is one of the most famous French conductor, François Xavier Roth. But he came to my house twice a week for many years when he was unknown and just a beginner and it was mm -hmm. wonderful. And then I dived and now I conduct, around, I happen to conduct 10 to, 20 to 15 times a year around the world. Next time we'll be in Taiwan in three weeks if you are there. <laughs> be happy to see you there. The uh, Symphonie Nashvé et le Concerto en Sol de Ravel. Um, that's a challenge which is almost impossible for me. As I told you, I'm totally clumsy, and, and now I, I think anybody can do whatever is possible. And then now I'm trying two new, new things, except writing and so on, uh, and uh, leading my foundation as much as I can. And I, I would be delighted to tell you more what we do with the foundation today, which is very important to me. But I tried on a personal basis two things that I'm not gifted in. Try to, to paint and to sing. <laughs> and I learned both with, and I'm not at all gifted. And I realized by surprise that painting is not so difficult, even if you are clumsy. And singing, I, I learned, I'm learning with a soprano, a friend of mine, which is a French uh, friend, which is a wonderful soprano. And I understand that is not so difficult. You have to try mm -hmm. and try hard and resist to the temptation of uh, giving up which is true for everything in life. Mm. You would never give it up anyway. You would never give no, up. No, 
You know, my, uh, you, you said that I was born in a Jewish family. For me, the most important thing is tikkun olam. What he said in Hebrew, tikkun olam means uh, the world is, imperf is not perfect and we are here to try to make it a little bit less imperfect after us. Mm -hmm. If we can do a small thing in order to help the world to be less imperfect, even if it's only in a small surrounding around us, mm -hmm. even if it's giving a small joy to one, two or three people, that's enough. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's what the criteria of my behavior. Try to be uh, mm -hmm. creating a, a better world for next generation. That's the name of our foundation. Positive planet means something which is positive is something which is in the interest of next generations. We work in the interest of next generation. And I do believe that we, all of us as parents, we behave in the interest of next generations for our children. We take decisions, or I hope you take decisions. They do. Uh, uh, making sacrifice in your own life in favor of, your, of uh, your children. I think the world will be much, much better, if not perfect, if we had the same criteria for collective decision, if, if it was not only for our children, but for our uh, decisions in terms of consumptions, voting, uh, uh, working, is any decisions that we take good for next generations? And I think it's a very important criteria of decisions. It may lead us to a very philosophical discussion about what it means, but I think it's, uh, if. Suppose that the world was doing that 30 years ago, and 30 years ago, suppose that we have said, okay, let's think about what will be the world in 30 years, and let's do what is useful for, that, for them, or for us. Um, we would not have this question of Paris Agreement and climate change. The situation would be totally different. Of course, there is an there is a, there is a, um, objection to that, which is said uh, by Marx, mm -hmm. Groucho Marx. Groucho uh, uh, Marx said, uh, why should I care about next generation, what they have done for me? <laughs> and uh, that's interesting. I, I, when, when I heard not him, uh, of course I'm not a young person, but I've not heard Groucho Marx saying it to myself. But when I heard uh, that Groucho Marx had said that, he said, let's wait a minute. It's a very powerful argument, but maybe it's not true. And then I took my my cap of uh, mathematician, I said, let's re let make a mathematical reason uh, reasoning. Suppose that there is no next generation. Suppose that as we speak now, next minute, no one anymore uh, appears as a new baby in the world. What happened? What happened is that uh, we don't need any more doctors for, for that. We don't need any more uh, clinics. We don't need uh, any more... Uh, primary school, secondary school, uh -huh. then we have no one to go to work for us in this room, then there will be nobody to pay our pensions or to work for us, and the last of us will die, uh, and will uh, shut the light, uh, nothing will happen, it will be a disaster. Actually, there will be no light for since a long, a long period because there will be nobody to work for, for that. Therefore, it is our interest today to work for next generation, even if we don't realize it, but it's very important for us, selfishly, to work for next generation. It's what I call the rational altruism. Mm -hmm. We have a rational interest in being altruistic. If we don't want to be naively altruistic, I am naively altruistic. I like to be altruistic. I give, I take my, my pleasure in being altruistic. It's, it's, it's a fun for me. But even if you don't do that, if you don't feel like that, you, we all have a rational interest in being altruistic. And if we realize that, if all of us, we, we realize that, the world will be different. We don't, of course not. Let me ask you one question about what I should call your method, as far as uh, you're a writer, an essayist, anthropologist, maybe some sort of a philosopher as well. You've devoted many books to um, main themes, and, and you always do the same way. That is, you, you're worried and you're thinking about what the future will be, just mentioned that. The way you deal with the future is to go back and start from the beginning. 
that is past, present, and future are just one thing in a way, according to your method and your books. That, that's method for my essays, but I write also mm. bi biographies, novels, theatre plays. Oh, yeah, I'm talking, I'm referring but to the essays, essays. The global yes, essays. I, I, I've been doing that since many, many years. When I first time I did that, when I wrote about music, mm. and I tried to understand how music could uh, be a way to forecast the future, and then I, and to forecast the future of music, <coughs> I began to think that. By the way, what is music? What is the origin of music? And then when I look at the origin of music, where I realize, which is obvious now, everybody knows that, that music is a, a ritual uh, embodied into religion, and it's a way to organize communication with the uh, uh, gods or whatever is a, a way of us. I realize that this gives a, a, a kind of vision of what music was in the past and the evolution moving music from relation with the power of churches, religion, to other powers, which was the princes, and then we have another kind of music linked to princes, and then another music linked to the market, to the, um, the fact that the market economy was developing, and therefore I, I can see through that where music can go. And it was not difficult to forecast a lot of things to link to music and music linked to other dimensions. And then when I tried to understand, I did that for many, many issues, and that for health, for ownership, for uh, time, for <coughs> uh, whatever, architecture, um, um, nomadism and mm. sedentarity. Uh, I just did that, I see this book here about the history of sea, oceans, where do sea is going? I do that also for globalization. I, I did that for Europe, many issues. I think it's important to understand the past, to see what are the, 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 the structure of what is not changing, uh, not, not, not in the last 20 years, in the last millenniums. Uh, if, for instance, if we want to understand the sea, we have to understand where do the water is coming and where the matter, water can go. And to understand that, you need to go uh, to the Big Bang. Uh, and, and, and if you have this, this lo very long-term perspective, which actually is very French, you, take, you see that in the uh, Ecole Francaise des, uh, des Annales, mm -hmm. which lo look at the history of the long term, which is one millennium, if you take the French way of understanding history. I think it's very important to us. For instance, uh, in one of my books, I, I, I try to understand the future of center of power in the world. When I saw that there was a group of uh, power which was ending with the Roman Empire for, for fifth century, and then a certain period where the central power was in Asia, and went back to Europe, and it was not difficult to realize that the different center of power in Europe were uh, specific cities where everything was the center, financial market, technology, ideology, wealth, um, scholars, trade, trade whatever, mm -hmm. and we can name these cities. Mm -hmm. Not difficult. Bruges, Venice, Antwerp, Gênes, Amsterdam, London, Boston, New York, Los Angeles. We can name those cities. And we can name when, and we can know which technology has uh, created the power for them. We can understand which crisis has triggered the movement, which was, who was the rivals, why this one has triumph and what the others are not. And then it's interesting, it's a key to understand what's next. If we, if, we, if we are humble enough to understand that we are only a small a sample of a time division of millenniums, only, of course it's important because we live here, therefore. We live today, therefore today is more important than any other period because of that. But it's not more important than any other period if we put that in, into the framework of long term. And that helped a lot. Of course, there are a lot of discontinuity, mm -hmm. which are very difficult to predict. Uh, but even the discontinuity, can put, for instance, I was more than a witness. I had the chance to be an actor of the, at the moment of the fall of the Berlin Wall, which was a bullshit. A lot of people say that the fall of the Berlin Wall is an important event. It was not. The only important event was a coup d'etat organized by Gorbachev in 85, it was a coup d'etat, 
to take over the power and the way he resists to the coup d'etat up to the moment where he destroys Soviet Union himself. But if it was not Gorbachev, and if we see the different events that went, uh, which led to the fact that Gorbachev took over, which is a fascinating story, which has not been told uh, uh, in detail, a fascinating story, a succession of three coup d'etat uh, before he took over. It, it could have been someone else. And if it was someone else, who could have, have today someone in charge of Soviet Union of the same kind of the man we have in charge in China. And nobody will, a lot of people say, well, it had to be Americans and the Star Wars and whatsoever that the Berlin Wall collapsed. Bullshit. It's a decision of Gorbachev. Nobody would have dared to attack the Soviets if the Soviets have decided to stay in power. Mm -hmm. They decided not. They decided that it was the moment where you should not shoot the people. That was a key decision. And today, if, uh, if uh, Gorbachev was not there, it would have been the same. But if today, and we have seen that in Crimea, well, we said a lot of things, but what happened? Nothing. Uh, if tomorrow uh, uh, China decides to invade uh, Myanmar, just to say something which is uh, improbable. Who would do anything? Nothing. Maybe well. there will be an interesting conversation in some interesting places, but uh, that's it. Uh, and then it's interesting to note, I say that why? I say because there are at a certain moment of time, that's why I say my two masters to understand history are Shakespeare, and Marx, not Groucho, Karl. Karl <laughs> uh, gives a long trend, mm -hmm. and it's fascinating. I mean, uh, Marx, as you know, was not Marxist. Mm -hmm. I wrote mm -hmm. his biography, and I, he's a fascinating <laughs> man. He was not Marx. He was not looking, he was against the idea of communism in one country. He thought that communism should come after capitalism, mm -hmm. globally, at a global stage, not in a specific country, and certainly not in Russia. At the end of his life, he wrote specific letters to the Russian communists to say, bullshit, you don't go nowhere, there is no chance, you will not succeed. But it was clear, because your, your country is too... too uh, he thought of Germany. Sorry? He thought of Germany. He thought of Germany the at the revolution. beginning, but not... Mm. not it, was, uh, it doesn't think that Germany could become a communist mm. country. It could become maybe a, a more advanced, mm -hmm. but not a communist. He thought that communists will be globally at a world level. Then that give a trend. And, and actually it's true. Uh, worldwide, w capitalism has not exhausted its potential of growth. Far mm. from that. And Marx was an amazing admirer of bourgeoisie and of capitalism. It's, it's, it's freeing the world. Uh, and, but there is also Shakespeare, who says mm. at a certain moment a leader can be stabbed. And when Julius Caesar is stabbed by... Uh, Mm -hmm. Brutus and some friends, uh, that that's changed the whole history of the Roman Empire. It was not an empire at that time. It became an empire just after his death, as you know. Uh, then, if, it, if Julius Caesar has not been stabbed, the history of the world would have been different. Therefore, we must be humble when we make forecasts, mm -hmm. because we don't know. Uh, we can learn through your phone today that something terrible happened uh, that will change the course of history. But it will be changing uh, just as a, as a small wave in the global trend. It will just be a small wave. Uh, by the way, some of Jacques' books are available here. Uh, if you're interested, and be, you'll be more than happy to sign them for you. Uh, since we're in the US, uh, give us your approach of the actual, I wouldn't say political situation in the United States, but the future of this country, which you deal with in your book about the seas and oceans. Uh, you've got some sort of a precise approach of what should, could, will happen here. The United States is the largest and richest and uh, more affluent. Oui, je vais stopper après ça et on va prendre des questions de la santé, ça? Excuse me. I, I will not interfere into American politics, of course. But I do believe that the U.S., is, if, if you look at the world globally, there is no, no rival to the U.S. as the leader of the world. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the U.S. would like to stay the, the leader of the world or will, will be uh, inward-looking, but no one will be uh, 
a potential successor. The only one that can be a challenge are two. One is China, uh, but in my view, China will not try. I think China, even if China will have the same the same um, defense capability as the US in, in 2040. Uh, GDP per capita would be very low, and I think that China, it's not, then we have to look back to the history of China for three millennium. My bet, but it's only a bet, mm. is that China will not try to become a universal power as uh, French, Dutch, uh, Roman Empire, British, American, wanted and, and became, which means to have an influence. I, I don't think that China would want to influence uh, what happened in Algeria, Morocco, uh, Syria, whatsoever. They want, for the moment and for a long period of time, they want one thing. They want to be respected. Mm -hmm. They want respect. They want respect from, from the world. There have been so many, so many times in the history since uh, 2,000 years, humiliated by foreigners, but mm -hmm. they want respect. And that will take a lot of time before it's, and, and even they have been humiliated by their neighbors, Japanese, Koreans, and many, many neighbors. They want respect. Then I don't think they're in position of willing to become, uh, and they have no culture. But by the way, I, very often when I look at the future of specific country, I look at three things. When I go to a country, I look at three things. I look at demography, which is of course obviously fundamental, I look at food and cuisine. gastronomy. Cuisine. Cuisine. <laughs> what do we eat? Mm -hmm. It's very interesting to understand the culture, agriculture, family relations, very important. And I look to music. Mm -hmm. uh, and when demography is good, when uh, cuisine is, is gl really globally accepted, and when music is international, then you have a nation that can have an influence globally. And think, you don't find a lot of countries today which are good in terms of demography, music, and cuisine. Not a lot. China, by all means, in terms of music, zero. Mm -hmm. Not a possibility to be an international world leader. leader. Therefore, mm -hmm. I, I do my bet, it's a bet, is that they will be only interested in developing their own, the fact of being respected, not to be a, a global... Uh, who else? If we dream, but it's a dream, it could be Europe. Uh, we have everything we, we need for that. If we have only uh, a possibility to decide uh, a merge between French and Germany, uh, to become one nation, to have one army, mm -hmm. uh, we have a potential, yeah. the level, the capacity, and one of the reasons I believe it is possible is that US is abandoning Europe, which I think is good for Europe. It's not Trump, it was true for Obama too. Uh, I think it's a long trend. Mm. Uh, the fact that Europeans begin to realize, let's just begin to realize, like people you know in the cartoons, we go through a cliff and do not realize that they are beyond the cliff. Europeans have not yet realized that the Americans have given up. Uh, and when they will realize, uh, either they will beg uh, to get the support, which some are doing, like the British, but it's not a question, or they will try to do to become adults. Mm -hmm. Adults mean to have their own army, and then they can bec become a superpower. One chance out of one hundred, but it exists. That's my answer to your question. Well, thank you very much for those views. Uh, please feel free to ask questions to Jacques if you have any. You have so many, so we'll try and give you a mic. So as to let you express yourself, is someone? Oh yeah, it's coming up. Coming up. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you so much for Mr. Atali coming here for lunch and talking about your takes on civilizations, etc. Uh, I, I assume that wanting to leave the world less imperfect. Uh, Simon Weil shared that philosophy a great deal, and we should all be grateful. Uh, but my question is, uh, currently, uh, with this populist, uh, 
populist uh, government we have now, the leader of the government who gained power through populism here, um, populism which started largely in this country and was, uh, was took seriously place with Huey Long of Louisiana and then was then done in Europe with Adolf Hitler. The first populism, is, is Marie Le Pen here now in the States doing her homework about populism and does France realize the hazards and the damage that could be done? I don't know to answer on, on, to answer on, on domestic American politics. The only thing I can say is that um, populism is not specifically American. And populism is not specific of today. Populism uh, is always there when there is a feeling that the leaders are not in charge. And then when people think that there is something wrong in the Kingdom of Denmark. And it happens always when people have a feeling that uh, the power is not in charge, have not the power. That happens and the consequences are always the same. Uh, populism, uh, authoritarian regime, protectionism, nationalism, and then war. I can give you, uh, we have many examples in history, one at the end of the 18th century when there was a beginning of thinking of globalization. Kant and Hegel has written books about universal peace and all that, and then nationalism came back and we had 30 years of war, Napoleon and French Revolution, etc., and it was a disaster. At the, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was also, which was a period exactly very close to, to our uh, a lot of technology innovations. Actually, we live on everything that has been invented at the end of the 19th century today. Electricity, car, uh, television, not television, radio, uh, gramophone, uh, telephone, everything was invented. Uh, electricity, was oil industry, was invented at the end of the 19th century. It was a moment of amazing optimism. Globalization, tour du monde à 80 jours. And then what happened? In 19, 1907, there was a financial crisis. And if a nation have decided to go towards a real global market, opening the borders, globalization, we would have had, I'm sure, a very happy 20th century. But at this moment, there was also uh, some element of terrorism called nihilism at this time. And nations decided to choose protectionism. And then, you know, for, that in, we be, in, in 1914, we had war for 75 years. 17, five. Seven, we 75, up to uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And the 20th century could have been a happy century. And today, it's exactly the same. Uh, in, in 1913, Nobody knew the name of uh, Mussolini. He, he, was, he, he was the only one who was known. And Mussolini was known as a uh, uh, low-profile Italian politi socialist politician. But no one knew the name of Hitler, Lenin. Lenin was also hidden somewhere. Uh, Stalin, of course. Uh, nobody knew his name. And today, I'm sure that we have the same kind of people around that can ruin the 21st century as these people that I just named ruin the 20th century. It's up to us. It's a matter of are we able to organize, to be proud enough of a globalization as it is and to make a jump towards a higher level of integration and globalization, which will be not only a globalization of markets, but also a globalization of rule of law. I would not speak of a global government, it's a utopia, but a global rule of law in order to be able to stabilize the world on climate as a beginning, because climate has no borders, which is obvious. But many other things have no problem. Either we will be able to do that, which I think is very, very improbable. And, and if you don't do that, then we will have populism as we have, which means that people want to get rid of the elites. In my view, that's exactly what is happening. Mean. People want to get rid of the elites. Uh, that's always the beginning. They want to get rid of the elites. They put other kind of people in charge. And these people are very often authoritarian. They, they, they begin to discredit the elites, and then when you discredit the elites, you also discredit uh, knowledge, culture, and we know what happened. And it's exactly what is going on, le, what, we, what we call in France le dégagisme. 
uh, what happened in the French Revolution in, in a certain sense. It's happening today under very different roots. And what we see is that in the world today, uh, who is in charge? In China, authoritarian regime. Russia, authoritarian regime. Iran, authoritarian regime. Turkey, authoritarian regime. Here, authoritarian regime. And in French, in France, I wouldn't say anything bad about the president, which is not only a friend of mine, but someone I admire and I support. But if we look at that from a, from a uh, objective point of view, it's a kind of soft dictatorship <laughs> with the support of a democratic parliament that has full power. And people are happy with it, and I'm happy with it. I am very happy with it. Because I do believe that people want strong people in charge today. And when there is no strong power, uh, uh, people think that everything is not good. And it's important to have, as we have in France, a strong power which is democratic, than to have, as we have in the other countries I have named, strong power which is far from being democratic. Then, then the key question now today is, are we going to be able to go further into multilateralism and globalization or not? If we are not going to be able to to sustain globalization, and it's why the climate agreement is so iconic. I wouldn't say it's, it's the only one. There are many other issues which is needed. But if we are not able to do that on this issue, then the 21st century could be worse than the 20th century in t because of the size of weapons we have and the nightmare that are possible. Soft dictatorship, you said, about France? Soft and democratic dictatorship within the limit of democracy. No, the word is dictatorship. Hmm? Dictatorship? No, well, I, I was just teasing you by saying that. Okay. It's a democracy, and it's a strong democracy. And I may say to you that the press is here to remind us that it's a strong democracy. So I wanted to ask you, Jacques, about uh, the future of the liberal world order and the impact of transformative technologies into this. And that's a very vast question, and I think we have very little time left. So one of the, the aspects I'm particularly interested in uh, hearing your thoughts on is how, in some way, I guess the Western view and value is that we know better for ourselves what is good for us, and decision-making is sort of, you know, the human being kind of uh, a central view. Uh, but then if we project ourselves out a number of years out, uh, other states or non-nation states uh, could decide that rationally it makes a lot more sense to have artificial intelligence agents in charge of war making decisions and and so is our western value system uh, in some way potentially going to be an impediment to our capability in fields like war making or others you know, artificial intelligence is also a, a Western technology, therefore we may use it also. And I am just publishing a book in two weeks uh, where I try to explain. It's another uh, the nightmare where inter artificial intelligence can lead us in terms of uh, warfare, which is a catastrophe. Catastrophe. It's a really a nightmare. And I prefer to use a novel to do it. But if we don't have a lot of time, I just want to be proud enough to mention an initiative that we have taken in our foundation, which is a, a very humble way to try to, not humble, megalomaniac way to, uh, <laughs> to uh, answer to your questions. Uh, I do believe that there is, a, there is room for more uh, democracy at the world level, and that technologies allow that. And we have decided an experiment, which is just beginning uh, two months ago, uh, where we have proposed at a world level, uh, uh, citizens of the world, to give ideas of what could, should be decided by the next G20 in Argentina, using the networks. And if you go to uh, the website upfortheplanet.org, you will find all the details where you can provide proposals. And we have received more than 100,000 proposals for to, as, as of today. We are hope to reach 1 million gather that into ideas, and propose that to the next G20. Um, this will be just a tiny example of what could and should be tried to get a better rule of law at the world level. Technologies allow it. Technology allow to uh, go beyond what the uh, uh, different uh, intermediaries are uh, limiting us to do. But of course, you're right to say that the dangers 
of uh, um, putting us in automatic system is, is terrible. We see that in the financial sector, we see that in defense, uh, and it's a way to wash our hands. We say, let the system work by itself. But I do believe that uh, uh, democracy has still a future, and that's a kind of, a, of attempt that I think should be tried to demonstrate it. Thank you very much. One more question. Last one. The last one. Merci, thank you so much. It's been so enlightening to hear you speak. I want to know about the future of Africa, which goes back to your heritage. But when you look at the future of Africa, the movie Black Panther notwithstanding, <laughs> how do you see Africa in the future? Then we are back for, we are here for one hour more. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, very often when I begin a lecture on the future, when I am to speak about 2050, I say, just remember one thing about what I'm going to tell you. Is that today there is 1.2 billion people in Africa and in 2050 there will be 2.5 billion people in Africa. That's the most important thing to remember. The future is there. Uh, Africa will be either an amazing uh, engine of growth and cultural change and potential development or a nightmare. And it would be true mainly for us in Europe. Uh, I do think that Africa can be a success. Uh, there is all, everything for that. Uh, but it's a huge challenge in terms of rule of law, mainly rule of law, in terms of education, in terms of women empowerment, uh, don't forget that uh, today, look at the figures, uh, Nigeria, Nigeria will have more inhabitants than the United States in 2050. It, it's difficult to swallow that, but it's a fact. Um, Sahelian countries, from Mauritania to, uh, to uh, let's say, uh, uh, Sudan, will be, uh, which are around 160 million today will be 700 million. 700 million. Which means, by the way, that Francophonia will be more than 700 million people. If, if we keep on teaching them yeah. French. If they speak French, provided which is, they which speak is French. Not, which, is not, which is not sure. Mm. But it's fundamental, by the way, it's why I'm a great fan, fan and supporter of uh, Francophonie. I think it's fundamental for the interest of France and the world that if we are not able to organize multilateral world, at least let's organize regional multilateralism, and Francophonie is an element of regional uh, multilateralism. Therefore, I do believe that uh, uh, the future Africa is, is a, a very long agenda, rule of law, women empowerment, okay. and if I have to choose one reform, which is one focus, it would be, it, it is girl education, education for girls, which I think is fundamental girls from the young girls up to the, to the ladies. And we, in our foundation in Positive Planet, we focus on teaching to the women, poor women, but they're almost all poor, how to, to be trained to create their own startup. Because they, they, they are in charge of a family, which is a, a company in itself, but they don't develop their own companies. And I think that there's a huge potential to create micro-entrepreneurs, micro-entrepreneurs in, in, in Africa, which, which will get rid of a huge challenge of unemployment in Africa. It's, it's an amazing challenge. If we don't do that, uh, I always remember something that has been said by Lee Kuan Yew, which was the leader of Singapore for, and a very, very wise man, who said to a friend of mine, uh, well, Europea you Europeans, you have a problem. Mediterranean is a too small sea which is a very interesting remark, simple as always, but very interesting, which means easy to cross uh, in the good or bad sense. And then we have to realize, to accept that Mediterranean Sea is just a lake, that the future of Europe is Africa, that if we do not succeed to uh, help development of Africa, it would be a nightmare for us. And this is a very good example of what I used to say before, which is the uh, rational interest of being altruistic. If we are not altruistic in helping Africa, all of us, 
then we cannot avoid that dozens or hundreds of millions of Africans, hundreds of millions is zero compared to uh, two billion, will cross the sea and come to us. We cannot avoid it, except if we do our best to help them develop. And then helping the education of women in order to reduce the number of children per woman. By the way, this is interesting to note that we always notice the number of children per woman, which is between five to seven according to the different countries. And you know, as it is, it is two in some countries in, in here and it's less than, than, even less than one in some countries. But what is more interesting is to know the number of children per man. And the number of children per man in Africa is 17. Which is explain everything about the nature of a society, the difficulty to organize savings. If you have 17 children, you cannot save. You cannot organize education. The number of children per man. The number of children per man, per father. Thank you. Thank you very but much. But I'm not pessimistic. I'm not, I'm not optimistic. I am positive. Thank you very much. Okay.